welcome back to Live and Breathe Horses. And today we are going on with our lovely book about Tom Dorrance, which is a collection of stories from those who knew and loved him. And today's story is an extra special one because it's from his wife, Margaret Dorrance. So who knew and loved him more than she did? So it's a bit of a long one today. So bear with us. <laughs> Margaret Dorrance. In visiting with people, I realised that a lot of folk never got to meet Tom. They wanted to know more about him and wanted this book very much. I've had support and help from many people. A special thank you to John and Joyce St. Ryan. Without them, this book would not have been. I want to thank all the people who contributed to this book. I apologise to the people that may have had other experiences and stories to share. It was impossible to contact everyone. I will say that it was fun making contact with people and remembering the times gone by. Remembering things that were forgotten and hearing about things I did not know. In living it, a person might think it's going to be there forever, but it isn't. I first met Tom through Ray Hunt. Some friends invited me to go watch Tom and Ray work with some colts. It was a way that I had never seen before. I asked Tom a question and he gave me what I thought was a flip answer. I was not impressed with him at first. It wasn't love at first sight. Later that day, we, we started roping a sawhorse. I saw that Tom could throw as well with either hand. Tom was pretty well balanced. We threw what I called at the time, odd shots. Tom thought that was a good name for them. It's now called old style ranch roping. Tom would probably still call them odd shots. Tom was a very special person. I believe he had a photographic memory. Tom's brother, Bill, acknowledged Tom's ability to remember. They raised purebred Hereford cattle in addition to the commercial beef cattle in Oregon. The purebreds were tattooed with a number in their ear for registration purposes. So they caught the cows to check their numbers when the calves were born. Tom, in his early teen, teens, mentioned that he knew each cow's number and that his older brothers could catch any cow they wanted to check his accuracy. They took that as a challenge and Bill said they gave out roping without Tom ever missing a number. Tom thought things out before he started to do anything. Tom's needs and his wants were about the same. He had no desire to be wealthy and never wanted much, but if he did want something, he was liable to want the best. I never heard Tom use foul words ever and never heard anyone say otherwise. He recited a lot of poetry. Sometimes when a person came off their horse without planning on it, Tom said a poem to them that fit the situation. One Sunday morning at daybreak, Tom and I left to get a heifer in that had escaped while gathering the rest of the herd. Tom took one ridge and I took the other. Tom said if I found the heifer to wave my hat and he would cross over to the ridge I was on. Well, I did find the heifer. Tom came across the ridge, tightened his cinch and got his rope ready. He proceeded to sneak up and rope her. Tom was on a three-year-old filly and we were on a hill. It was not to Tom's advantage. The heifer started down the hill the way he wanted her to go. There were quite a few small trees, so when the heifer got going too fast, Tom went around a tree, slowing her most of the time to a stop. Tom would let her go and then go around another tree if he needed to. That's the way he got down the hill with the heifer and into the corral. To be there and see him do this was amazing. Years ago, my family lived quite a ways from town and a blacksmith shop. When they needed something, they made it themselves. Tom learned to fix almost anything. He made blevins, buckles for the saddles, and they looked very professional when finished. He made or repaired any kind of riding equipment that was needed, including chaps and bridles, as well as recovering a saddle. 
When Tom was on the ranch in Oregon, he learned to spray the heifers. He also helped the neighbours to spay theirs. Tom was a figuring person and also good with figures. When the calculators came along, he never used a calculator. He did his own figuring. Tom spent quite a bit of time with his brother Bill, wife Mary, or Marie, and three boys, Billy, Dave and Steve. I was visiting with Steve when he mentioned all the things on the Doran's Mount Toro Ranch in California that Tom made easier and handier for all to enjoy. One of the big things that we all enjoy are the automatic gates. They can be used in all kinds of terrain. The vertical lift gate is still being marketed. Tom decided on a gate that would lift up on one end because of uneven ground and snow. He was raised in snow country in Oregon, where a swing gate would not work year round. Tom also invented another kind of gate that raises up on both sides with an overhead. Oh, sorry, with an overhead. <laughs> this gate was never marketed, although there is one at the Merced Horseman's Arena in Merced, California, and also one at the entrance to the Mount Toro Ranch. You can read more about the gates in Jim Glyden's article. I always told people the reason that Tom followed his dream about making an automatic gate was because I usually did the driving and Tom never liked to drive. There were lots of gates to go through where we were most of the time and it was the passenger's job to open the gates. <laughs> of course. Charlie Van Norman of Tuscarora, Tuscarora, Nevada, got one of Tom's gates and placed it for entering a corral. Charlie's wife, Della, brought in a cow that was a little out of sorts. Della was quite pleased to get her in the pen and was easily able to drop the vertical lift gate with the remote control she had in her pocket. Shortly after she'd corralled the cow, Della started to unsaddle her horse and somehow accidentally pushed the remote control button and the gate opened. The cow got out. Della called Charlie and told him what had happened and she was not very pleased with the gate. When Charlie told Tom what had happened, Tom's comment was, guess the gate isn't people proof. <laughs> Charlie and Tom got quite a little chuckle out of that incident. Tom helped me to saddle my horse from standing inside of the horse trailer tack room door. This put me in a high place and the horse in the right position. I then take the saddle off the saddle rack, turn and step aside to place the saddle on the horse's back. I would not be riding today if Tom had not taught me to do this. When he first showed me, I didn't really want to take the time to do this because at the time I was able to throw the saddle up on the horse. I didn't realise Tom was getting me ready for the future. Tom had great foresight. He knew at some point in time I would not be able to throw the saddle up on the horse. He seemed to know there was a possibility that I would want to ride long after I could throw the saddle up. I'm sure thankful for his great foresight. Tom often got on a colt from the fence as he used that to help the colt get comfortable being up next to the fence. In turn, that helped the colt he comfortably be comfortable next to the gate, so it was easier to teach the colt to open and close a gate without hassle. That was also helped. That also helped me to be able to get on a horse now, later in life. When Tom got on a horse or colt, before he even moved the horse's feet, he gathered them up and started them stepping forward with the hind foot first. He had them walking very fast as that helps put the drive in a horse. I would often try to get my horse to walk faster than his. That happened only once that I can remember. And when I let him know my horse was walking out, out walking his, it never happened again. <laughs> Tom welcomed a horse that was fresh. He never loped one down and he usually took care of it in a walk. He worked at putting the drive in a horse when they were fresh. He actually worked to all the things when the horse was fresh. 
He roped the colts in a 60 foot round pen. He would put the rope around where the cinch goes with the onda of the rope down so it would drop and never get tight or bind. He would then swing the rope in a forward motion to encourage the horse to keep moving forward. Then he would place it in the middle of the horse, never tightening or pulling the rope, swinging the rope in a forward motion until the horse accepted it. He did the same for the flank area. Sometimes Tom had a comment that when a person was having a problem, feeling like they were very stuck and seemed like there was no way around it, over it, under it, or through it, Tom would say, it's the darkest hour just before dawn. He often kidded while helping someone and would say, if it works, I'm serious. If it doesn't, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was usually the one that got blamed for something Tom did or didn't do that caused a person to be unhappy. It happened more than once and finally I mentioned it to Tom. His comment was, well, yeah, it might be one of those reasons a fella gets married. There are some things that can't be blamed on Washington. <laughs> I remember laughing about that comment. Tom was not very social until later in his years. At Tom's 80th birthday clinic, a group of people gave Tom a PA system. A close friend asked me if I thought Tom would use it as he was known to be quite reserved, almost shy. Well, for those who saw him at the party, I think the question got answered. In fact, at the end of the day, Tim Erickson asked me, is this the Tom we used to know? Tom was quite pleased with a young man called Alex, who was about 10 years old. We had a lesson horse at the time that was a good lesson horse, but not a babysitter. He would get turned around after leaving the stable if a person was not right with the horse. This young man was listening to Tom and doing really well. Alex said to Tom, you can just feel his mind. Needless to say, this really pleased Tom. There were some children paying close by and Alex's attention turned to them and the lesson horse turned around. Tom, at one time, travelled around and visited with friends that had horses. And if a person has a horse, they are liable to have a horse problem. Tom would work with them and their horses. At this particular ranch, there was a fellow working there that had an eight or nine year old boy. They warned Tom that he might put dirt in a person's gas tank if he didn't like them. When Tom met the boy, he shook his hand and said he was pleased to meet a young man like him. Tom visited with the boy and got really interested in what the young man was interested in. Tom never had any problems with him. We were at one ranch where I kept my horse and one morning I heard this kitten crying that was in a building. After trying to find where the kitten was, I climbed up on this loft and saw that the kitten was down about eight feet in this wall and couldn't get out. I found Tom to tell him about it, thinking there was a small chance that he could do something about it. Tom never hesitated. He got a quarter inch nylon rope and climbed up on the loft and made a loop and dropped it down over the kitten's head. As the kitten was looking up, this made it easier. Tom pulled the rope easy so it tightened around the kitten's neck and then he pulled the kitten up real fast. There was the kitten out and safe. We gave her to the mother cat and they were both very happy. About a week later, I heard the kitten again. So off I went to the rescue. I got the quarter inch rope and made a loop and again, the kitten was looking up. So it made it possible to get the loop over its head and I slowly tightened the loop around the neck and started up with her and then midway I hesitated and lost the kitten. I remembered how Tom had done it so I started over and this time I didn't hesitate. I got the kitten out once more. This time I covered the hole and we named the kitten Wally. 
A few of us were moving a herd of cattle on Tim Erickson's ranch. There was a bull that was out of sorts, and when I tried to move him, he let me know that he wasn't going to cooperate. So I just left him for whoever was coming along after me. Tom had mentioned earlier for me to do just that. Later on, Tom came upon the bull, and the next thing I saw was Tom going at a pretty good speed, heading across country to get another bull that was off to himself. I mentioned to Tom, it looked like you were sure in a hurry to get to that other bull. Tom told me what had happened. The ordinary bull hit Tom's horse in the rear end when he was trying to move him, and as Tom was on a young horse, instead of pulling him up, he just let him go. The horse might have bucked had he not let him go. Another time, <laughs> we were moving a bunch of cattle along a road past a turkey ranch, then past some young Brahma bulls in a pasture. The turkeys would go gobble gobble, then <laughs> be real quiet. Then when you thought, or the horse thought, they would, they would not gobble again, they would. And that was a little nerve-wracking for a young colt. A little further along the road, the, the young Brahma bulls in a pasture, and they have a different sound than regular cattle. When they make a sound, it's like a low-sounding hum. Tom was on a young colt. He was at the back of the cattle drive, and I was in the middle. I heard a horse coming at a fast gallop, then Tom went by me with a little grin on his face and they stopped up in the lead with Tim. The colt might have bucked had Tom pulled up on him instead of just letting him move out until he regained his confidence and realised all those strange sounds were not going to hurt him. We were on a ranch in about 1968 and Tom started a couple of fillies. I had the privilege of watching Tom. He was about 58 at the time. One of the fillies would go, then stop and freeze up. Tom just waited on the filly, but that didn't mean he was doing nothing. Tom was steadily encouraging the filly to move forward. At that time, she could have fallen over or done anything a person would not have wanted to experience. She was dangerous. Tom's brother Jim said with a horse like that, they usually didn't go on with them. Tom got her through that in just a few days. Later, when she had confidence and she had some time on her, she became the horse on the ranch that everyone rode. The other filly bucked a little at the beginning and she also became a very dependable mare to ride. After. Tom used her on the ranch for a while, Tom put her in a half-breed bit that a friend, Art Harson, made for him. Art was a real good private bit maker. Later, I had the privilege of riding that mare in the bridle, and I've never forgotten how good that mare felt to me. It was the best feel of a bridle horse, bridle horse that I could ever imagine. Tom bridled three or four more through the years, but mostly he rode them in the snaffle bit. Maybe because we were always starting young horses or dealing with ones that had problems. But then again, Tom's snaffle bit horses were very handy and he could do just about anything a person could do with a bridle horse and maybe more. As a young person, Tom was very shy and Tom's friend Cliff Wade showed a couple of Tom's bridle horses at the fair in Oregon. I don't think Tom ever showed a horse. I'm not sure, but I never heard of him showing. I saw the trophies that Cliff had won on Tom's horses. Tom never talked much about what he did or could do with a horse. He just did what he could do when the need arose. And I think it was so self confidence and satisfied within himself that it never occurred to him to talk much about it. Tom liked to work with the babies when they are still on their mothers. When working in a small arena, Tom would get 
would pet the mare and get her relaxed. The baby seeing him there would get a little nervous and start nursing. When the baby was nursing, Tom would reach under the mare's neck and gently touch the baby on the rump. The baby would think it was his mother. Tom would be careful not to be in the line of the baby's heels if the baby decided to kick. Once the baby got used to the touch, Tom would scratch the baby while it was nursing. Eventually, Tom was able to pet the baby coat all over and the baby enjoying the attention. One of the ways Tom got to be able to pet an uneasy colt's face was by taking a coffee can with sweet grain in it and get the baby eating out of the can. When the baby got to eating pretty eagerly, he would put his hand over half of the can so the baby colt pushed past his hand to get the grain. The colt got used to the hand touch and the smell Tom built on from there. Baby colts are very itchy and like to be scratched and love the attention, so that is very helpful. Tom would never grab or scare a baby colt. After he'd gotten the colt used to the touch of his hands, Tom would often take a square quarter inch twisted nylon rope, just a short piece, and rub it over the colt while petting it. Then the colt could get used to a different feel. He would then put it around the baby's neck, both ends free at first. If the colt got scared and wanted to leave, Tom would let one end go free so as not to tighten the rope. As the colt got used to it, Tom might just ask for the colt to take a step to the side towards him. After the colt took a step, he released him and scratched the baby. Then he would ask again and again. Then Tom would make a big loop with the soft nylon twisted rope and gently place it over its head and around its neck. Then he would ask for one step at a time and soon the baby would be leading. Tom would just suggest and wait. Tom said, waiting doesn't mean doing nothing. During the time we're working with the babies, it would depend on the colt as to how or what Tom would do. Tom often said, it all depends. I started a colt and had only walked and trotted the colt, so you know it wasn't very far along. Some friends came by. I'm not sure what the conversation was, but the next thing I saw Tom got my colt and saddled him up. Tom rode over to the fellows and I saw Tom just sitting there on the colt, all relaxed, and then, from nothing, he made a nice departure. The colt had never been loped before and that really impressed me. The colt was so relaxed and not tight at all. Tom tried to show me how to do a departure and it was some time later on another horse that I finally accomplished it. Tom's success was, as he explained, starting the colt from behind and waiting for the horse to go, not go before the horse. But again, waiting did not mean doing nothing. There are, these are some of the memorable things that happened while married to that sweet, lovable guy with a dry sense of humour. I loved him very much and I'm so grateful for the time we had together. I kidded him about noticing the pretty woman and he said, of course, well, I may be old, but I'm not dead yet. In roping, when Tom got older, Tom said, I throw the rope where I always did, but it just doesn't go there anymore. In walking with Tom, in walking when Tom got older, Tom said, I step as high as I always did, but the foot just doesn't go high anymore. The young fellow asks the older fellow, how come you have such good judgment? The older fellow answered, I guess it comes from experience. The young fellow said, how do you get that experience? And the old fellow said, I guess it comes from bad judgment. Tom would often say experience is what comes along right after you really needed it. 
in trying to figure out a problem with a horse or something he would ask. What happened before what happened happened? <sighs> in trying to figure out, oh sorry, <sighs> I think I'll just do that one again. Trying to figure out a problem with the horse or something, he would ask, what happened before what happened happened? Then on some days he would just say, before it happens, I heard that a lot, usually after it happens. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you for joining me today. And thank you to Margaret for sharing all these wonderful memories with us. Look forward to see you next time and keep tuning into the light. Mm -hmm.